Uh, yeah, welcome everyone to the first uh, fresh convo, fresh conversations that we're hosting. A uh, little bit of background. My name is Bart van der Zonde. I'm one of the co-founders of the Fresh Venture Studio, um, the or organization that, that set this up. Uh, we are a startup studio on a mission to a regenerative and circular food system. We intend to build uh, multiple new steward-owned organizations uh, to, to help the transition, accelerate the transition to a regenerative food system. And in that context, we are continuously looking and getting into conversations on what are the actual problems or where are the opportunities that would require more attention from entrepreneurial teams and, and talent to work on what would really help the ecosystem forward in, in bringing about this, this more regenerative food system. Um, Koen van Seijen, one of the co-hosts today is someone we, we talk uh, a lot with on this subject and uh, um, we really like his podcast as well for those who don't know it investing in regenerative agriculture podcast really a lot of great conversations on this uh, subject and we decided to start hosting sort of open conversations uh, about specifically what are potential opportunities that would need more uh, entrepreneurial energy I would say or what are problems that are still very hard to solve that could uh, really deserve some additional attention from, from maybe a different type of people that are working on it right now. So that is sort of the central question uh, today. Um, sort of for on the technical part, I would like to invite you all very much to contribute. There is no set program for this conversation. So uh, please share your thoughts as well, your questions, things you wanna bring into this group of people. I think it's an interesting group. So. Um, do so. If you want to say something, uh, I would like to ask you to make it a little bit civilized uh, to, to add uh, a comment in the chat and then we'll make sure that the people get or raise your hand like Kundis did uh, and then we'll make sure that we sort of pass on the talking stick, I would say. Uh, before I, I move into this, I have one short poll that I would like to do. Uh, this is to get a little bit of an idea of the people who are in this uh, space right now and also that you have an idea of what kind of people are here. It's always a little bit difficult if you're digitally connected and not physically. So uh, Paul is going to start a poll if you can answer it, two questions, and then we have a little bit of an idea of uh, who we all are. Uh, should be quite easy. And we'll share the results in a, in a little bit. So you have a, you can see what the rest is doing as well. 85% voted. All right, everyone, everyone voted. So uh, Paul, if you can share the results. Most, most of the biggest part of this, this group is an entrepreneur themselves. Uh, investors and knowledge workers come in second. And also quite a, a quarter of the group is intending to start a new business, uh, probably a reason to, to find uh, answers to the question, all right, where to start, where can I make the most impact? So, all right, thank you, uh, Paul. My co-host uh, of, uh, of today is, uh, is Koen van Zeye. As I said, Koen, uh, you have been doing over 120 interviews. I think you said over five or six years, you've, you've been in, in the game quite long and you've talked to a lot of people. So I wanted to actually start with you in, in raising this question on what do you think and what would you say after these 120 interviews are the biggest problems, but also opportunities for, for venture building? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, first of all, for organizing this. It's always nice to show up somewhere and not having to do all the background and all the organization. And I'm very happy, obviously, that Fresh um, got started after many, many discussions with Hoop and Bart uh, back in the day and over the last years. I think I've done a number of shout outs in the podcast that we need more venture builders while you were building your venture builders. So I'm very happy that it's public now and, and uh, ventures are being built. So for me, I mean, for anybody that doesn't know, uh, the journey we've been on is I think we started interviewing now about four and a half years ago. It feels a lot more, or maybe five, I have to check. 
Um, but it was very sporadic at the beginning. We just interviewed a few friends, interviewed a few people, honestly, for me to hang out with uh, people virtually that were building or are building interesting things in the regen food and egg space because I didn't know what I wanted to build myself. I'm not a farmer. I don't have the, the huge urge to start a farm, uh, nor honestly uh, the investor because I don't have the wealth. So I really wanted, what can I do in this space? And I thought the best way is probably to hang out with people that are building things. And to do that, I had to interview them. And of course, I had to also to publish them, but it was not even part of the game. Um, so we, we did that for a number of years. And since the last two or three years, we really um, brought some more structure to the table. And now we're releasing an episode a week and we're doing a number of series and it really, really became a small media company. In terms of lessons learned, I think first one is it really the attention for soil. Of course, my bubble has grown, but really exploded over the last years. Um, which is amazing. We need way more attention for uh, the way we treat land, oceans, and, and basically our planet, and way more attention for the opportunities. And what we've seen, uh, we, we sort of identified four themes, um, I think a year and a half or two years ago now, which are still very current, that we see huge challenges, also huge opportunities, not necessarily the easiest places to build things, but definitely in our mind, uh, huge opportunities over the next decade or so. These are long-term games. So don't, don't expect anything fast, um, but we see huge opportunities in food as medicine. So nutrient density, the measurement of um, how can we show that this tomato is different than that tomato? How can we show that connection between healthy soil, healthy produce, healthy gut systems, healthy people, and then ultimately healthy ecosystems? There's a lot being done. There's a lot of luckily grant capital moving into the space. Um, companies are, are claiming all kinds of things, but I think there's still a lot of space like what are food companies looking in the future if we take food as medicine seriously? Um, how, did this, how it's going to look, I don't know. We're going to see a lot of changes, I think, over the next years. The other one, and Willemijn knows a lot more about that, is lens and also actually Tecla, landscape design. How do we bring this region ag discussion and the regeneration of an hectare here, 10 hectares, 10,000, et cetera, to a landscape scale? How do we bring that discussion of bringing back rivers, um, stabilizing climate in, in certain areas. We need to talk at ecosystem level and landscape levels because we're literally running out of soil. And we need a lot of innovative companies to do that. Technology, food companies that, that, that operate at a landscape level, that buy the full rotation. I literally had a discussion with Nestle, all, all people yesterday, and they say, we're going to buy the full rotation, uh, which is very interesting at a landscape level. And so people are thinking about it, but we need to look at a larger scale landscape is or ecosystem or biome is is really the um, the operating principle we need to use because otherwise we stay in, in very very nice but very very small and marginal discussions then ecosystem service payments super interesting as well very crowded at the moment a lot of people are jumping on the carbon bandwagon obviously still i think a lot of space if you look at uh, payments for biodiversity payments for things that we all need farmers can provide or land stewards but we're currently especially through, through food, not paying for. Of course, there's a subsidy uh, train you can take, but it's very, very complicated. And we just released, did we release already? Anyway, an interview with, with a colleague of Willemijn on how to calculate returns at a landscape scale. And I would definitely see that as a, as a piece as well. Like how can you start seeing all the different flows of capital and non-financial returns that come off regenerative agriculture? And how do you pay? How do you get more money in the pockets of farmers? I think that's a central question. And then the fourth, Transition finance, how do we finance all of these transitions? How do we help farmers to, to bridge those gaps, the yield gaps, the drops, et cetera, et cetera? How do we make sure food companies go through the transition of sourcing different ingredients, et cetera? There's a lot of innovative ways to, to travel time there, to, to bring things forward that we would like to see happening now. Planting trees is an example. They're an amazing investment, but it takes seven to 10 or sometimes even more years. How do you finance that? That's a finance question, but somebody has to build a company to do that. And the fifth sort of theme that we've seen recently, or I'm getting very excited about, and that's why I'm so excited of the, the steward connection here, the steward ownership, is regenerative enterprises, who is not only very ambitious when it comes to building soil or rebuilding soil, but also extremely ambitious when it comes to everything else, all the uncomfortable questions around inequality, land access, profit share, racism, all the big questions agriculture forces us to ask, and we often don't. And I see some organizations taking that on, that head on, like very, very seriously. And I'm very happy about that. And I'm, we're planning with the podcast to follow them. 
Thank you, thank you, Poon. That's uh, that's quite a lot, as you like to say. That's quite a lot to unpack as well. Uh, but maybe already get a, a few other people people involved as well. And uh, again, please uh, enter your own remarks or, uh, uh, as Willemijn does now, share resources with us in the in the chat as well, so we can get you guys involved. Maybe you mentioned uh, Willemijn already, uh, Koen. Maybe we can uh, uh, ask her to to jump in because you mentioned landscape design as well and. Maybe Willem, Willemijn, you can briefly uh, tell a little bit about what, what you are doing, who you are, and then, uh, yeah, I wonder also what your perspective is on, on these questions, like what are the main problems, but also what are the opportunities that you see that, that we need to work on? Yeah, so first of all, thanks for inviting me. I feel um, like I like you are really more an expert than I am, but I'll try to do my best to, uh, yeah share uh, some experiences and, and it's great to see Tekla here. Uh, she's also part of our yeah, growing community of people working uh, either on regenerative businesses or on landscape restoration and there is a connection. Um, so I work for Common Land, it's an Amsterdam based organization um, engaged in enabling large scale holistic landscape restoration, um, also uh, built on regenerative businesses. So we believe you know, uh, it can be business driven uh, landscape restoration. So you can actually restore soils and ecosystem functioning by yeah, doing business differently. Um, so it can be different products also um, coming out of the landscape. This can be fiber, food, um, uh, drinks. Uh, so it can be a lot of different things and, and it's a really exciting space. Um, so we're, we're, I think we're known for the four returns method. So it moves away from maximization of return uh, of an, on investment per hectare, so getting as much as you can out of the land in a short amount of time towards maximization of interaction per hectare. So how can you create more diversity between people, between businesses, uh, but also in, in terms of biodiversity. So bringing back diversity in all its shapes and forms to move away from this yeah, monoculture growth oriented uh, way of using land. Um, and I think the challenges so I think carbon is an opportunity and a challenge all in one, <laughs> because it's really, if you wanna measure carbon, for example, on a large scale, you're just gonna, you're going to have to work with proxies and it's going to be incomplete. So I, that article I just shared has a good analysis also of that. Um, plus um, carbon is just one of the multiple things you can create uh, and, 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 and actually can also create financial streams around. So we are, looking at that space and, and seeing what we want to do with it. But we also uh, sort of don't believe the hype in a way, <laughs> sort of be think from an ecosystem perspective. So how can you indeed reward land stewards for whatever they're um, performing on the land in terms of uh, producing regeneratively? So that can be biodiversity oriented or carbon oriented or water um, quality, um, but just looking at it more holistically, not just running away with carbon um, and forgetting about the ecosystem. Nevertheless, it's also a huge opportunity. I mean, there is a lot of capture, uh, carbon that can be captured by soil and by different land practices. Um, uh, so, so definitely a beautiful development, but something to just be aware of. And, and uh, I really recommend reading that article, although it takes an hour to read. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, and other challenges, I think, Mm, a landscape approach in itself is, is can be a bit challenging and I think Tekla can also uh, talk to that it's it's just uh, you are effectively engaging a system change you are working in an ecosystem uh, with a lot of people living there using the land infrastructural um, projects uh, so it's you have to deal with everybody in that landscape and that's challenging so we're trying to, you know, also learn from the Theory U community and how you can, you know, engage in a system. It can be education, can be health system, but in our case, it's a landscape system and engage in different types of conversations. So we know how to restore landscapes, basically. We know how you can restore ecosystem functioning. We, we know a lot more about how you can restore soils, but the tricky part is getting people to collaborate for longer periods of time. So we're working with a 20 year time frame minimum, which is basically one generation because an ecosystem uh, needs that time to be able to regenerate and, and create a new stable um, system basically. Um, but the trick is to get people to work collaboratively on longer periods of time 
because often we speak different languages, we have different stakes. Um, sometimes the funding runs dry. So how do you engage into deeper relationship building between these stakeholders for longer periods of time? And I'm realizing I'm going off on a rant, but I hope it's useful. So that's a, a second challenge, yeah. Maybe uh, because I like the ranting uh, personally, okay. uh, maybe then we can, because you mentioned Tecla as well, and, and we, can, we can ask her, uh, her experience as well. Uh, but in this bringing together multiple stakeholders and, 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 and is there, what is, why is that difficult? I mean, I, I have my ideas, but I would, I would like to hear from your experience as well. Like, why is it so difficult to bridge? Uh, mm. I think because we're so used to compartmentalizing things, it's either you are either active in a value chain or you are active in um, uh, in your own role in the municipality. So we're, we're, everything is very siloed. Um, so breaking through those silos and thinking from what others might also need in that same landscape or that same piece of land requires, uh, yeah, giving in a little bit and, and, and not just thinking about your own stake. Um, also, what's challenging is the long-termism thing. So we are so used to projects, three years, five years, if you're lucky. Um, uh, and of course, from a business perspective, that it, longer term is, can be uh, either the obvious route or, or your, yeah, I don't know. The short-term, long-termism is interesting from a business perspective, but um, yeah, just sticking with it for a longer run, that's, that's the challenging thing because we, we have, we don't have that horizon normally. We're so project oriented, short cycles, uh, even in government, we have four year cycles of people being elected. And then once they know all about the topic and start to understand it, and I think it's a good thing. I mean, you don't want to have monopolies of, you know, politicians staying for too long, but it does create this short termism. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. It, it does. I have a bunch more questions, but maybe let's let's touch a few more people and then we can yeah. engage in, in a broader conversation. So uh, maybe Tekla, uh, Willem, I mentioned you already. Maybe you could introduce yourself briefly as well and 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 uh, zoom in on a, a similar question. Actually, uh, what kind of problems do you see now? I listened to the podcast you did with Kuhn uh, today. Actually, uh, you're you're facing quite a lot of challenges in general, I think, but what are specific uh, problems you also see that might be transferable to different contexts uh, as well? Um, yeah, um, thanks Bart. Um, so yeah, I'm Tekla and I uh, am a co-founder of uh, Grounded. It's an organization we're actually based in South Africa and we work with farmers in Africa to help them um, switch to regenerative agriculture. And then we build businesses on the back of that where we um, uh, actually connect them to markets um in yeah to answer and it's kind of um i've been doing this now for about seven years um and encountered many challenges i think maybe the first thing which i think is quite important to acknowledge is that ultimately uh, regenerative agriculture is about farming with nature and what we have been doing um uh, over the past what like 60 years or something is farming against nature and more in a sort of linear um, yeah I don't know how to actually describe it in English but um, not with nature but um, it's a more linear approach where it's like okay this is the spray program for this um, particular farm and you need to just execute this and then you're going to kill all the um, uh, pests which are on this land if you just follow exactly these steps um, and this farming with nature requires a much deeper understanding of an entire system, which is actually specific to every single farm and every single circumstance where you are. So it's maybe we need to all acknowledge that this is extremely hard um, to do. And in particular, if you take it to a landscape approach, which um, you already hinted on, which makes this even more complex. Um, so it's, it's definitely not something which is um, easy, it's quite a beast, and therefore it also takes more time to um, create the challenges. That's not to say that you cannot have like quick wins in the beginning, and it's like there's actually a lot that you can do relatively quickly and you'll see results. 
um, but it's also hard. Um, so in the work with, that we do on the ground, there is just hurdle after hurdle after hurdle and unknown after unknown after unknown. And I think it's important that as a community, we um, talk about those things because then we can actually learn and progress. Just like there has been a lot of science on the sort of conventional agricultural system, we need a lot more knowledge sharing and science on the region system. Uh, and not only saying this is great, please give us money. Um, and I think um, maybe two other angles that I can take, like to build on what Kuhn was saying, like what are sort of venture opportunities. If I look at it more um, in grounded, we take more of a value chain um, approach. And I think there's quite a lot of focus on uh, and initiatives happening on a farm level. So farmers switching to regenerative. And there's also quite a lot happening on the brand side. So brands claiming that they're going to be regenerative. Where I see two sort of gaps is one is what happens before the farm. So where does this farmer actually get his or her inputs? This, is, this has been a major hurdle for us. So um, regenerative seeds, organically certified seeds, what kind of um, microbial applications can you actually use? Um, fungi uh, that you want to actually grow, how you make the right kind of compost. So because farmers are used to actually getting consultants in who then sell them whatever kind of fertilizer or spray programs. But in the regenerative system, they have to do something different. They still have to use inputs, which they can often actually make themselves. Um, but how to do that, um, th there's a big opportunity there, I think. Um, and then there is also an opportunity, I think, between the farmer and the brand where this is a system, our food system is dominated by huge companies that pile all agricultural commodities on one heap and then ship them and transport them and make sure that everything tastes the same. Um, where there are massive opportunities, I think, um, to do this differently or to work from within those companies to change them so that um, products which have been produced regeneratively can also get to the brands that are looking for these ingredients. And then you can have more value transfer, otherwise you lose the value because everything just goes on the one heap and it's lost. This is an issue we are facing all the time. This is something we have to deal with. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Super insightful already. Uh, Kuhn, maybe, uh, I don't know if you want to respond. I have a few questions, but you're always... Uh, I see, actually, Albert is asking just in terms of, of a bit of uh, background, what, what kind of crops are you dealing with in South Africa? Take like, Just for people who have no idea what, what you're doing, just to give a bit of background when you say ingredients, yeah. What, what do you mean? Yeah, we don't do like vet, fresh vegetables or something like that. We, uh, we work with non-perishable high value crops. So we're in essential oils and seed and vegetable oils. So those are like pressed um, and herbal tea and spices. We're not only in South Africa, also in Zambia and in Tanzania. So it's a lot of these um, crops go for export um, markets. And, and do you see the same issue that actually uh, the, the Nestle person was discussing that issue of as soon as you are applying uh, regenerative approaches or practices, often uh, crops, farmers start to grow different crops and obviously they need to find markets for the different crops. Is that something you're, like you, you're saying, okay, we're, we're also buying your two other, three other crops, even though the cash crop is honeybush or is et cetera. Is, is that something you're figuring out how to buy the full rotation uh, as, a, as a quote that I think Dan Barber uh, once quoted, but is that something you're working on, something you're seeing, or is it getting way too complicated because then you have to deal with three, four, five, in some cases, six, seven, 10 crops? Yeah, what we try to do is build it on, top, on the back of what the farmers are already doing. And often actually the smallholder farmers that we're working with are already selling, they already have a range of different crops. So they'll have, um, maybe some maize, maybe some spices, maybe some vegetables, and um, they'll sell a lot of the stuff into local markets. And then we can help them capture a higher value for 
for instance, these spices that we can then actually export and get a premium for. Um, so I think, yes, this is definitely key, is you want to find product market combinations for all these crops in the system. It's not something that necessarily we as grounded are going to sit between the farmer and the market for all of those things, because some of them, they will actually be, ideally, they will be able to sell them off themselves into local markets. Yeah, but it's definitely something you need to take into account. If you let them grow crops, which they can't sell themselves, it totally sucks, of course, and they, they're, they're, they're super dependent and they, yeah. Yeah, it's a great, it's a good bridge, actually. I see that Alfredo un, unmuted his video. I don't know how you say that, actually. Um, switch this video on. Alfredo, one, two, three, welcome. Uh, I know you're multitasking. Very, very busy, happy you're here. Can you talk a bit about that? Because that's in agroforestry systems. Uh, obviously, you are dealing with multiple crops, especially as you're moving towards more regenerative practices. What do you see at that? Uh, you're dealing with a, a cash crop like cocoa or a cash crop like coffee. And then what do you do with the other crops? Uh, so thanks, uh, thanks for for um, for having me and for for inviting me. Um, first, uh, first of all, um, I would like to uh, just jump in on what uh, uh, was just uh, was just shared uh, before answering your your question. And I think, and I second totally what was uh, the analysis that was just done on the. Um, on the supply chain and on the opportunities uh, that uh, that can be um, that can be found beside the pure play, um, uh, let's say investment uh, at the farm level or uh, what the, the claims of the brands, um, especially on the on the organic agri inputs, I think that that is uh, that is a. Uh, um, an important opportunity and, and us as one, two, three, we, we created an incubator uh, exactly for tackling this, uh, this kind of challenges. And specifically, we are now launching uh, an organic agri input uh, management uh, company. Um, and uh, um, uh, regarding, regarding your question, so um, when we set up uh, agroforestry systems, um, in, in our farms, yes, we do have um, our cash crop that is primarily uh, either cocoa or coffee, um, but we do um, we, we rely on this cash crop um, in, in, in pairing it with, uh, with other crops that um, for us the first uh, main reason is uh, um, the climate resiliency of, uh, of the farm. Um, and so uh, and also um, Having the, the possibility of uh, with these uh, with these uh, let's say uh, uh, other multi cropping to to have a um, a more positive uh, a more profitable uh, first uh, first cash crop. So let let's make a, an example that probably everybody already knows. Uh, but uh, but mm, cocoa trees grow well in the shade, uh, and so um, for, um, for for achieving this uh, this result. Uh, we plant uh, either coconut uh, trees or native trees or uh, bananas, um, and therefore um, we um, we enrich our product array on one side, and on the other side our our cocoa grows better. And then, obviously, in the course of uh, the um, uh, let's say uh, of the growth uh, of the of the farm and on the field, um, the the the, the cropping system is is managed and then there's there's some changing and and optimization so so yeah um and uh, on what do we do with this uh, uh, with these other crops besides just uh, having uh, them in in uh, um, in, a, in the system and helping us with the, with our let's say first crop um well a lot of our effort uh, is uh, now um, uh, geared towards finding um well and and stri and, and signing um, sustainable offtakes uh, offtake agreements uh, with uh, with these brands that are claiming to uh, uh to want reg regenerative agriculture sourced foods um and we've been able to do it for example for our banana so we have uh, we have a good contract with uh, uh with a german supermarket chain um, and we are now opening for, for example, coffee and coconut oil and all the, um, the byproducts of, uh, um, of, these, uh, of these crops. So does that answer your question? Absolutely. And, and I have a follow-up follow question. Um, first of all, can you just in, in one or two sentences, uh, because I obviously realize uh, we're, we're talking to the in crowd here, what, what is one, two, three? 
Um, and then to briefly mention, because you said something very interesting on the incubator you're starting to build companies that are serving your farms. And um, so what have you, you've launched two companies so far, what, what are you, and, and then what are you missing on that side? Like, what would you love that somebody launches? Yes. Um, okay. So, uh, in, in a couple of words, what uh, what wants uh, what is one two three? One two three is an asset manager um, slash operator uh, German company um, that was founded in uh, two thousand and seventeen, and so far, and it targets um, the management uh, and uh, uh, of funds. Uh, for institution of institutional investors. So our anchor investor is a, a group of uh, German pension funds, and we uh, together um, together with them and, and other investors, um, we have uh, uh, we we were successfully able to um, to basically have uh, more than five hundred million dollars uh, uh, committed to um, to our to our uh, agroforestry systems uh, and uh, and the management of our farms and forestry projects um, more or less half of that uh, is is actually invested um, and, uh, um, and we focus on uh, um, agroforestry systems so climate change mitigations uh, local communities um, and and social impact and so we we both start the uh, um, uh, farms from scratch with a greenfield approach. Uh, our our specialty is again uh, cocoa um, in in Latin America, and we have now seven um, uh, sorry thirteen projects in seven countries uh, in, um, in especially in Latin America, and we focus at uh, um, with projects at scale. Uh, so we do not uh, usually do um, uh, small small farms, but we operate on uh, on significant scales. Uh, also because of, uh, of the nature of our investors, but we do also engage with smallholder farmers with programs around our, our let's say, big farms. Um, and this is obviously a pure play regenerative agriculture and agroforestry um, investment or, or strategy, if you want to call it. Um, and uh, we soon realized that, that there was, uh, um, as, uh, as was uh, shared before, a need uh, for um, for uh, let, let's call it the value chain or the supply chain that goes around uh, the, the what is being done um, specifically on the farms. Um, and therefore, we decided to launch this uh, uh, one to three impact incubator um, that so far has uh, uh, launched uh, two uh, startups. One is a, a per, um, fertilization fertigation company that has already been successfully funded in the first uh, in the first year and now, it's uh, um, it's tackling projects uh, um, that need assistance uh, in in designing um, irrigation systems that uh, that bring a lot of um, efficiency uh, to to the farms and and uh, allow for the um, for the applications of of input in the fertigation system and just uh, um, as, as spraying or uh, or direct uh, or direct uh, input. And uh, the second one is instead uh, um, um, an agri inputs uh, uh, management um, advisor. Let's call it like this. It's a one. It wants to act as a one stop shop uh, for for agri inputs uh, management. Um, usually, again, for we starting from from our experience. So most of these uh, uh, um, ventures uh, are born trying to give answers to. Um, let's say market failures um, that we observe uh, in, uh, in our big farms. So usually they are tailored for, um, for large scale farming operations. Um, and, and what we are trying to achieve with this one is instead helping these, uh, these big farms and big uh, operations to switch to a more organic and regenerative agriculture approach. Uh, what we are looking for next, uh, uh, we identified more or less five major uh, opportunities among these, uh, there's uh, definitely precision agriculture, so drones and G uh, GIS uh, mapping, um, and uh, um, and this is probably one of the um, of the ventures that we are probably going to uh, launch sooner than than others, and as well data management uh, and all this, but uh, but this is uh, still far off for for us in the, at the moment. Thank you so much for that. Sorry, Bart. I, I went down a rabbit hole. That's good. It's good. Uh, thank you also, Alfredo. Great no to problem. meet you. I, I haven't, I, we haven't properly met. Uh, I've heard about you from uh, Kuhn. 
Um, I actually also want to get back a little bit to Tekla, what she was saying, uh, because there were sort of three things uh, that, you, that you said. The first one was about the knowledge sharing part, and I, I tend to hear that uh, more often, I would say. So, uh, and, and maybe the rest can chip in on that as well. And you say that there's a sort of a lack of knowledge sharing, or we should do it more uh, as well. Maybe you can get a bit more specific on on your journey, uh, in what moments you you you've done things that you would have need, uh, well, maybe experiences from others, and and what would be also a good way to actually get that access, uh, elaborate a little bit further on what's missing there, and 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 what we what we should deliver there. Hmm. Um, yes, there's so much uh, knowledge that you need if you do this, like if you actually do this on, on the ground. Um, I think maybe the first thing you need, like that I, I wish I would have known is that it is flipping hard. <laughs> um, and that is, I think something that um, is quite useful to know <laughs> before you start. We were told that this was easy. Like I had read about it and I'd seen all the nice movies like, you know, from brown to green. And I thought, okay, this is fantastic. I'm gonna actually just do this. Um, but it turned out um, it's a little bit harder. You can turn go, go from brown to green. I noticed quite quickly if you have good rain, but um, <laughs> that's, that's another, yeah, exactly. That sometimes that's actually a challenge. Um, what's hard on a, on a farm level, I think is that uh, what I hinted on already is you need, farmers need to acquire a different kind of, set of knowledge to be able to operate their farm regeneratively um, and so you need to look at the soil differently you need to understand what kind of life there actually is in the soil you need to analyze that you need to then fix for things which are out of balance so if there are too many nematodes you need to find a way to fight that without like killing them all and killing all the all the, all the other life in the soil which and it's those kinds of things which are actually very difficult it's or for instance deciding what kind of cover crops are you gonna actually plant um, what does this particular piece of soil need in terms of nutrients and then which crops can we grow here um, given the soil and the water um, availability and sometimes the land maybe floods or it's very dry or whatever you know so it's there is just a lot of knowledge that goes into actually doing this on a farm uh, level and i think then on, then on the back of that um what is what is also really hard is that once you then have all the farming elements right you need to then get a product that you can get to a market for which you need to have an an entirely different kind of skill set and especially if you have new products that you want to get into new markets for instance that we did with essential oils you need to understand how do i get a good quality essential oil so you need to do product development tests um, uh, chemical analyses um, whatever and then you need to understand what are actually the requirements of the different buyers who are these buyers how can we access them etc which is a totally different kind of skill set so there's just a lot of yeah, yeah i don't know if this kind of answers your question uh, well i think especially on the on the first part that you and maybe willemine I'm, I'm not sure if you've been involved but uh, yeah, you're, you're talking about like what what do you actually need to do and i think Comalan uh actually build a uh, sort of a toolkit that you can sort of say what kind of conditions you are what kind of context you are and you can roughly uh, get some information on, on, for example, cover crops and and and, and uh, what to work with. So on the one hand, I see sort of twofold thing, and maybe someone else can chip in on this, and maybe we'll align. But on the one hand, it's like almost Google it. Like, is there an information center? Uh, if 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 I understand you correctly. On the other hand, it also relates to, and I saw some questions coming in as well, like the actual experts or the the independent agronomists or people that can actually help you. Uh, uh, and maybe also help you on the in, on that input side, uh, and and you know, well, both of these challenges is is that a correct read? Like that you need both of them, like the expert, but also the knowledge database uh, that you can use. 
Well, I, I'm, so I shared a link to a, a short story, which is which was called the six biggest lessons learned on regenerative agriculture, which is basically us trying to capture the knowledge in the network of partners like Grounded, um, similar in other countries, um, and how they, yeah, what they've picked up on the road to regenerative agriculture as, as part of a landscape initiative, basically. Um, and one thing that we found was that there's a huge science practice gap. So like you mentioned, there's a lot of research backing conventional agriculture up, but there's no equivalent amount backing regenerative up. Um, of course, you can look at agroecological research. There's probably more there, but still it's a huge gap. And also there's a mismatch of if, if, if let's say you were to pilot with a group of farmers, different practices, um, then it's hard to find scientists that can deal with that level of complexity because you're not just looking at two or three elements you're looking at a whole system so that also so that was one big um thing in terms of knowledge gap and um there was another one yeah so interestingly we saw that farmer-centric networks kind of were the way to go um for farmers to exchange with each other they're also they have a lot of knowledge already uh, but just being able to to experiment together uh, and 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 share knowledge about that. Visit each other's farms uh, frequently. Invite expert speakers that can help you along that sort of learning journey you're on. Because once you understand this, you also want to understand that, and then you want to understand that. So it's like it never stops. But you just need to pull in the right people at the right time in that farmer-centric network, kind of. Um, so that's from a sort of a helicopter view. That's what I saw happening. Um, and um, yeah, so the tool you mentioned, so um, we, we, we're trying to develop a couple of sort of, yeah, general tools that can help sort of move towards that um, holistic thinking uh, towards, for example, your regenerative business. So we have one um, tool where you can look at your um, farm or estate if you have one from a sort of four returns perspective. So what are the sort of things you can take into account when you look at your farm? Um, we also have another tool, uh, a business model canvas, just the old school, like old school business model canvas, but then, yeah, sort of twisted a little bit more towards a holistic view and, and taking a landscape also into account. Um, but it's by no means perfect, but it's just us trying to sort of pin it down and, and make it tangible. Um, but feedback is always welcome. Thank you, uh, Willemijn. We we also got a bunch of questions in the chat, uh, Kuhn, If if you uh, if you, you want me to uh, unpack them very quickly, <laughs> the first one I think of Chris is is it's a very good question. Why are we not ready? Why are the organizations we know not doing twenty million but a billion, etc.? I had a discussion on that yesterday. My feeling is we're too early. Where we don't have the the proof of concept like Willemijn is, is sharing like at a landscape level at uh, hundreds of farms doing all kinds of different uh, products at a scale that we can get a billion dollars or more or a lot of money, let's say, because for that you need institutional investors and they need to see a long track record. Like the first investments in renewable energy or renewable energies were also not institutional investors. They were obviously subsidized based, but still it was, it was a slow start before we got to the level we are, where we are now. So my feeling is really we're going to see these, these examples being built over the next years, and all, all of us will probably feel like they're too small, um, but they are already thinking about the next fund, or they are thinking about their next uh, 10x time, what they need to raise to really make a dent in the Midwest, talking about the med agriculture. But we're still figuring out the recipes. We're still figuring out, really, we're so early on. Like We have to like, take less as the whole value chain or the whole value web has to be redesigned and refigured out in terms of ingredients, in terms of expertise and coming to a question of poll farmer consultants, it really depends who pays them. If the input companies pay them, we know what kind of advice they give. And so that whole that's a whole other um, um, business opportunity in terms of education for farmers. Very tricky, very difficult, but there's a huge need to, to have independent farm, farmer consultants. So capital is working on it, others are working on it, but we need, we need to be able to make sure that farmers have an independent advice uh, that they can trust that is not sold to them by an input company uh, because if the incentives are aligned like that we know what happens just like shell is going to tell you we're going to help save petrol which obviously we all know is not going to happen um which is not because they're bad it's just because their business model is different so i feel we're really early on we should we should really crawl before we're going to run or we're going to stand 
and, and we are in the crawling phase in many phases, in many other places, not necessarily, but as a system, as a movement, we're super, super, super early. And, and we just don't have, we cannot point to two, three things that are already raised a lot of money, have huge successes or huge acreage, et cetera. Like New Foundation Farm still has to start and they're raising now as we speak. Um, and they're only raising only because it's a lot of money, but 20 million. Um, and perennial, we all see as a huge success, but they only raise 10. Um, and so it's, it's really, let's, we have to build the foundations first. And these are pieces, potentially pieces of the foundation. So I hope that answers it. Um, Alice, I saw a question on the cultural and socioeconomic. Access is an enormous question. Like, how do we make sure this is not, again, another elite game, like many of the other food movements have been, farm to table, organic, and many, ex many examples, et cetera. Um, how we're going to do that without some extra flow of capital in terms of subsidies or it's going to be very, very tricky. I, I hope we're going to move the food discussion to medicine and then suddenly we open up a whole different discussion in terms of insurance in terms of what what am i willing to spend on health and not just on feeding myself but that's a long long walk we need to do there so i don't know the easy answer there at the moment it's a it's not as accessible as it should be and cheap calories and processed calories are way more accessible so that that's um a very difficult and there also there's a huge education like we are what we eat literally um but most people or a lot of people don't see it if you see what, what a lot of people throw in their supermarket uh, basket when you when you are at your local supermarket you, you'll be shocked or you are shocked probably because most of it is simply not food i mean nestle did an internal research which came out unfortunately through, for them in the financial times i'll put a link in below that 65 percent of their products can never be claimed healthy and so they have huge issues of uh, with the new super with the new uh, traffic light system of, of is it green or not like can it be named healthy in france and australia they're already doing that most of their products are simply too salty and too sweet and so they know that, but how are you going to change a behemoth like that doing, I checked it yesterday, 93 billion a year. So it's, that's a very, I mean, cheap calories are cheap and, and not very cheap if you take into, of course, true cost accounting could potentially fix some of that. Um, but that's a, it's a very difficult one. How do we keep this accessible to, to all, especially to the people that need it most that are eating the worst food at the moment. And, and we, because we potentially all here on the call are already shopping locally, are already making choices differently. So there's not too much to win, honestly, um, when you look at us. Yeah, maybe I can chip in there. That's also something on a farmer level that's, um, I think, relevant to think about, because um, I think most of the pioneering examples that you see on regenerative farms that get everything right are people that also had the cash to spend. Um, and this is something which is very frustrating for some of the farmers that we've been working with, because then you point them to those examples. You say, look, you can here, it's possible. And then they're like, yeah, OK, but this guy had a shitload of money and that's how he made it possible, you know. Um, so it, it, it's those examples can be inspiring to outsiders, but they can be super frustrating and actually off putting to farmers who are just common farmers and who have to make ends meet and who are like, yeah, but that's just unattainable for me. Um, so then you have to go like smaller steps, things which are immediately interesting to them, like reducing input costs by making their own compost tea, for instance, which immediately can fertilize their crops and they can see the result. So those are things that we are also working on. It's like, how can you make this transition affordable to farmers who have very little to spend um, without having to always resort to massive subsidies, for instance? Um, I think that's a very exciting thing to think about. Like, how can you make this show a poor farmer that a small investment can lead to an immediate return? Which I think is possible in some cases, like maybe not for the full transition, but in many cases, I think there you can actually do things there as well. Yeah, thank you both. Oh, thank you. We have a bunch of more questions, but uh, maybe, I don't know, Alice or Chris uh, couldn't answer your questions. I, I'm not sure if any of you uh, wants to respond or, or uh, has additional questions. Well, I would jump in. Yeah, I would ask, um, <clears throat> I want to poke around, um, Kuhn, your thoughts on new foundation farms related also to what uh, Tekla said about having a lot of money and being able to put into a farm, this this decent amount of capital, and then wanting to showcase or demonstrate 
uh, regenerative agriculture as the way to go for other farmers to copy in a, in a nearby location. Um, is there, do you see evidence of that or do you see kind of potential challenges there? And I'd also like to, if possible, briefly hear a little bit from Tekla about some of the kind of more specific uh, challenges that you face, whether it's expanding the amount of farmers under that you're working with or expanding to another geographical location. Um, kind of the specific things that are really bottlenecks for you in, in that context. You want to go first, Tekla? Uh, no, you can go. So on, on New Foundation Farms, I, uh, just for anybody who doesn't know, they are raising 20 million, buying a thousand acres in the UK, potentially scaling that a number of times and being a fully regenerative, fully integrated regenerative food uh, enterprise, or agri-food enterprise, as they call it. And we're following them with the podcast because I find them uh, extremely ambitious, a very interesting team and doing things very differently, like Chris is saying. Um, and I'm interested because they do things at a certain scale or they are going to try to do things at a certain scale, which maybe unlocks certain things that we that an individual farmer can't, meaning building a proper food brand, selling it to the city, um, having a farm shop that, that operates year round and, and actually drives a lot of the value back to the land, having more than 100 people on staff. And operating at a scale that's a, that there is a, there is an economy of scale like let's not deny that um, it's a very different thing obviously because they start with a sort of clean slate they will buy the land they will, can do whatever they want with that they will never sell it um, so they have a very long term at least plan let's see what they uh, will be following that so I'm very curious about that because it shows a different operating system or a different model at a different scale that according to them makes sense in in the UK very context specific obviously. So let's see. I, I don't know. I think um, once you have that brand standing, you can sell a lot of the food through uh, the food brand and proper marketing, proper design. If you see their uh, their data room, they, they they thought about this a lot and they have a lot of experience with selling, with selling food. I think you can absorb a lot of other food from the area, from farmers that are nearby and make this transition a lot easier for people that don't want to, like I said in the chat, every farmer needs a market, that don't want to set up their own food brand, that don't don't necessarily want to do that because you, you don't want to wear 15 different hats and um, they want to have access to the best technology that you can have if you share it with, uh, with a major hub like that. So I think if you offer a good market and have uh, a good sense of the quality and the regenerative practices, then this could be very interesting, could fail completely in a couple of years and we look back like this was really, <laughs> this was a bad shot. Uh, but I think we need to be ambitious. We need to be bold in, in the current sense. We need to, to question a lot of things about agriculture. And one of them is the single family farm with a small farm shop. And, and we all hope that that will save the world um, because I think there are a lot of issues with that. So we need professional organizations and companies as well running some of these. And, and so let's see where, where they get. Um, yeah, I will go quickly. I think... Um... On the model, the, the model farm thing, and then having other farmers copy that is, I think, very often challenging because in the model farm, you, like I just mentioned, you then invest a lot of resources, and then for the other farmers surrounding that farm, it can sometimes be difficult to get to that. Um, so that's one comment. Um, um, in terms of uh, barriers to scale for grounded. Um, for us, the success in our model lies in making it successful for the farmers, um, because that will allow us to scale. So if we can make this work financially for farmers that we work with, then we can also scale. Um, and barriers there, um, I think there are two which we are now um, addressing. One is money, um, because you often need to have some kind of capital to get this whole thing um, started. So we're looking at raising our own fund uh, within Grounded um, to be able to scale more rapidly and have a little bit more, more leeway that we can actually choose areas which we think are interesting and get started. And the other thing is uh, market access. And for that, we are um, an, an access to the right kind of market. And for that, we are launching a platform, hopefully next week, um, which... Um, is geared towards giving regenerative um, suppliers access to niche brands. So kind of bridging that gap that I was talking about earlier, who are looking for regeneratively produced ingredients and then hopefully getting those um, suppliers a better price. Um, 
And that will hopefully also allow us to scale more rapidly because then we can um, onboard all kinds of different suppliers who we can then provide support to get better at regenerative agriculture. So we see that market link as a sort of scaling mechanism so we can reach many more um, suppliers than we are currently doing. Nice, thanks for that. By the way, that's very exciting. To, uh, two nice initiatives that you're kind of folding into that. That's very, I'm looking forward to see that platform. I wish you guys the best. Uh, yes, we're crunching at the moment. Well, not me, as you can see, but my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, thank you, uh, Tekla. We're, we're also almost already at the end. It's, it's a one hour conversation. Uh, uh, we're going to do this way more often, maybe uh, zoom in on the specific parts of what we addressed today, even to get in, in a little bit more detail. Uh, maybe da Danielle, uh, you to, to mention you, Kuhn, uh, you, you responded. Danielle, you mentioned, uh, if I say your name right, Danielle Cezano. Uh, Correct me, please. Uh, you mentioned a few uh, things. Maybe it's it's a, a good closing remark as well because you just you mentioned a few ideas that you think are going to be relevant in the space, and maybe Kunya can respond to it as a final uh, yeah. remark. So, well, basically, just present myself. Um, I'm Daniel Chizano, the founder of Adapta, is a startup that works in Brazil on regenerative agriculture. I currently have joined the IDB, the Inter American Development Bank. I'm um, helping them invest a part of their fund in, um, in a larger portfolio on regenerative agriculture. We're creating an, a, in a, a green hub to uh, invest uh, basically with the best, largest multinational companies in, in Latin America uh, in regenerative agriculture. And I'm also a farmer. So um, I I'm a, own a small farm here in, in Rio, close to Rio de Janeiro. Um, what, what I see is that a lot of people usually, they talk about transitional finance, but for me, this is a second bit, is, is a key. If you don't have a system to manage the transition at scale, then you cannot have transitional finance because transitional final is, finance is a scale issue. And then we have uh, companies like one to three that they actually have uh, the expertise in home house that they've developed their own system but how many companies do we need to create to develop this sort of system? So I think that developing a mechanism, a clear mechanism that parameterize these processes and manages the transition at scale, that would be actually very important. Because when you do that, you start collecting data, and then you're going to have artificial intelligence, and then you're going to have all the satellite data, you know, with carbon. Uh, region network is doing great thing with satellite images for, for monitoring carbon, which can be linked to blockchain. You can have traceable products with traceable impacts, and ultimately we can up came up with a marketplace online platform that eventually can substitute current trading uh, uh, um, structures. You, you can actually, and that's in my opinion, that's where we have to go: create trading mechanisms, large scale that are gonna sell tradable impacts and tr tradable product with tradable impacts. And, and I think that's when actually gonna start working at the landscape level. So, you know, this should be a little bit my, my take on that, how I actually see the market evolving. Thank okay, you so much, Daniela, good to see you. And I think we're on top of the, or not on top of the hour, on, on the bottom of the hour. So Brata, we'll give it back yeah. to you. Yeah, I I'll, see I'll... Uh, there's, there's a lot to be built here. Um, almost every piece of the value chain has to be, value web has to be rebuilt. So we, we better get to work. I think so as well. I, I'm going to wrap it up for today. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much all for coming. Uh, as I said in the beginning, we recorded the session. So uh, I will follow up with all of you. I'll try to capture some of the links in this chat as well. Make sure that that is in an email uh, together with the registration. Uh, so you can uh, uh, watch it again. Uh, we are currently with Fresh uh, working hard on this mission, trying to get more teams working on these challenges. So if you uh, know people who want to work in this space, especially uh, we are starting up a cohort uh, at the end of this year, trying to build these new, new organizations. So uh, also on the input side, like ideas or uh, problems that you run into, but especially on the talent side currently, and we are very much open for people that want to build new ventures in this in this space. So 
uh, yeah, please, please share. Um, we will have a next event actually on the 7th of July, uh, which is a fresh talks uh, around a similar subject that we will invite uh, probably three uh, uh, different pioneers in the space to tell more on a specific use case that we can dive into. Uh, this is more of an open conversation and probably uh, Kun and I will uh, host another uh, conversation like this at the uh, at the end of uh, July. Uh, let's uh, let's see how it goes. If you have any ideas on on maybe a more focused discussion or topics that you would like to get into in this in this conversation arena, I would say, or you you would like to have some speaking time, uh, please reach out to us. Uh, you can either email me or do it via LinkedIn. But um, yeah, let's uh, get this conversation going. I think there's a lot more than we uh, could cover today and. Uh, Especially also thanks for Willemijn and uh, Tekla uh, for, for being here and, and sharing your story. So uh, thank you very much. And I uh, hope to see you the 7th of July. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thanks, thanks, Bart. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Bart. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you all, Fredo. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bart.